it's officially 6.30, so I'd like to call our December 12th, 2022 Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting to order. Could you please call the Yes. Aaron Angel? Here. Scott Kelman? Here. Jeff Allenbogen? Here. Manoj Gangwar? Yes. Paige Lewis? Here. Nicholas Novello? Here. Dan Olson? Here. And our uh, Tim Waters, our council liaison, is not present. Thank you. All right, let's move to approval of the previous, oh, approval of the agenda first. And I'd like to request that we move new business before old business. And otherwise, are there any other changes? If not, I could take a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I'm, go for it. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. Um, I move that we uh, amend the agenda for new business to take the place of old business and approve. Great. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor? <laughs> okay, now let's go to the previous month's minutes. Does anyone have any changes? Scott. Yeah, I don't think any of our speakers were from online. I think they were in the list. Sure. Yeah, they were. Um, we had a, well, we did have a long launcher, but she did not speak. Okay. And one was, and <coughs> just that, yeah. Yeah. And one was, <coughs> and then everybody else was locked out. Okay. 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 <coughs> and then we had one small change on number. Seven. The first question, Scott, I think, asked if Steve was going to post a notice or something about the clay soils, but the way it got captured didn't really make sense. I am planning to, not okay. about the clay soils, but take, there will be a public notification process before we take soils away from Dry Creek Park. I just think we need to clarify the question. So did you ask... Uh, yeah, I asked if there was going to be a public yes, and he and said Steve yes. Said yes. Not right. that did Steve notice that the clay soils were moving. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Like all the pieces were there, just not in the right order. So. I'm going to be providing a notice once we get the schedule for the contract and once the court goes out to We'll notify as okay. noticed. Yeah, it's all along those lines. All right, anything else? If not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes okay. as amended. A second. I second that. All in favor? Great. Do we have any public that would like to be heard? Okay. Seeing none, before we jump into new business, I have a couple of things. One, if this is the last meeting for Manoj and Jeff. So I just wanted to thank you both for your service. It's been really fun to have you. I appreciate your commitment to parks and open space and the community. Maybe we could just have a quick round of applause and thanks. Awesome. Um, the other one is just a quick reminder that we as part of our bylaws do operate by Robert's Rules of Order. And I know we're not the most formal board, but I think we've gotten a little bit away from that. So one of the things I'm gonna ask is that we remember to just raise your hand if you wanna make a comment or ask a question. Uh, it really helps me to be able to kind of manage the meeting overall and make sure everyone has a chance to talk. So just a friendly request for meeting management. Okay. Uh, new business. David, I don't know who's picking us up. Yeah, I think um, we'll go back and do everything. Is it, is it the uh, try the relations? Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> I'll get Taylor here as well. So, tribal nations. So, yes, we, we chatted a couple times now with the work that um, the city's been doing with the different tribal nations and Indigenous peoples run the, the Front Range area here, and there's definitely interest in hearing a bit more about that. Um, the work that I can talk a little bit more about is um, the work we're really doing with an IGA that is still going to legal, so I won't share the whole thing, but I can share some general concepts of that IGA. And really how we're going to do 
our attempt is to do a better job of working with those tribal nations, those indigenous peoples on um, them as stakeholders, helping to be part of decision-making processes, including them as they were neighbors as process, even though they may not physically be here this time because um, the tribe has been moved to another state or they no longer have um, the direct access to this area, but historically they were part of this front range area. So how we include that. So I'll talk a bit more about that at the open space sort of level, but Cameron is here this evening and she's going to talk a bit more about some of the things that we've been doing as a city at large. I've been involved on the periphery of those, but Carmen really, <coughs> we're very fortunate in Longmont to have Carmen because if we're working with City of Boulder, Boulder County, Carmen is always there and always doing a great job of representing the city and some of the work she's doing. So do you mind Carmen doing that higher level? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Carmen Ramirez, Community and Neighborhood Resources. Uh, so did anybody do their homework on the links that we sent to you? Uh, and if you saw the documentary, you saw that this has been a process of um, creating trusted relationships that don't happen overnight. So when it comes to our open space, a couple of things, as David mentioned, Boulder County, City of Boulder, City of Longmont is working together to try and find consistency in how we work with tribes and also not to um, overtax because we have a tendency to ask people to volunteer like yourselves and to do a lot of work uh, without being mindful of the relationship and what is the long-term purpose. Um, so that's really what the IGA is going to be, is that the three of us can work consistently <coughs> across Boulder County, uh, open to other communities who are smaller, City of Longmont, uh, sorry, City of Lafayette, Town of Erie. They have some interest in, in joining, and lots of times, this way, they don't have to start the relationship. We've established a relationship uh, already. We are the first city in the world to become a sister cities with a sovereign tribal nation. There's been nobody else that has done that. Um, there's a lot of reasons, good reasons. <laughs> uh, and we actually were told not to do it. Um, but it was very interesting, this whole process. So over the last four or five years, We've been building relationships. We've been talking about open space. I can tell you that when I meet with elders and they talk about um, how they used to come through this area and go up to Estes and gather uh, medicine and where that medicine lies. And it's interesting because it's the, some of the trails that we take and they're like, but I can't tell you where that medicine is. I can tell you where some of the medicine is. But it's very interesting that that is not a story that is told about our open space. And David has been amazing at supporting us to really in, be inclusive of that history of the Native people that were here and have been displaced. Before the Chicago colony, there was a lot of other people. So with the IGA, they're working with 13 federally recognized tribes. You should also consider that we have local indi indigenous people that have lived here for a very long time. Um, so that was it. David, did I miss anything? No, I think that's, I, I would like to maybe open some questions yeah. on some of that higher level stuff. If you have questions about the videos, if you watch them or some of the work that Carmen's been doing, I'd like to give you a chance to talk a bit more about the open space piece of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there any questions? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. So the, the intergovernmental agreement is just between Longmont, City of Boulder, County of Boulder, and it's about how you all will work together in engaging with the tribal Exactly. Nations. Exactly. Uh, from that kind of um, partnership, we'll then be able to create, if you think of tribes that could identify from Sandstone all the way up to Estes Park, there's several jurisdictions in there. And so it will create that consistency and relationship that we are nurturing. And what kind of activities will that entail? Likely at the beginning, and David, tell me if I'm wrong, it's really identification of their trails, what existed, whether it was gathering of medicine or gathering of food or uh, animals. Um, and where did they come in the summer? Did they come in the fall? Uh, that narrative. Um, I know I had a conversation with the folks at Sandstone about uh, telling this, uh, the story of Sand Creek Massacre. There is one version right now, and that version was written by John Kaufman. So there should be a second version. 
Um, so correcting the history will be part of that. Uh, where it could go later uh, is really dependent on the relationships and um, the different government entities and how they would work on that. And I think this is going to be a evolution process. It's not going to quite happen all at once because there's pieces in there that um, City of Boulder much further along than any other entities as far as their collaboration and their work with the tribes. Um, I think Longmont was some of the work we have done is further along in different aspects. I think um, City of Boulder probably more on the, the formal governmental sort of piece. I think Longmont more on the relationship piece and how we're building that. Um, I will preface this with kind of a personal piece in this story too that I can make that commitment that as we move through these conversations that um, having worked with Carmen and the tribes that I, I just really think that Longmont has an obligation to do a better job of telling the story of our open space properties. So engaging the tribes and when we talk about even from the naming of a property, I mean, you know, it feels like, you know, nothing was even really acknowledged before there was a ranch, Hall Ranch, Hall Ranch, White Ranch, um, Sandstone Ranch. I mean, it's, it's just this idea that, you know, before there was a ranch, there was really nothing. How do we do a better uh, job of talking about that story <coughs> and bringing together? This is going to be a hard part, too. It's probably going to take some time because there are conflicting stories of how things happen. I don't, I don't know personally that we are on the have the ability to change that narrative immediately, but I think it's going to take time and dialogue and relationship building and trust to do a better job of telling that story and hopefully come up with something. But we can do a lot of things that really tell very factual pieces about who was here and what they did and why this land was important and including the tribes in those in those conversations. Um, that to me is a piece that in an open space background and, and do this for a long time, I think one feels very comfortable, it feels like the right thing to do is the direction that I think City Council has given us, and when I tell that narrative, it's pretty easy to tell to most anyone. As you read through this IGA, um, there'll be things that talk about co-management. There'll be things that talk about um, return of lands, and those will be conversations that I think can be hard for people to have, um, and it's gonna be a community response to that. And I think for me, helping to carry that message is gonna be working with our community on how you have those conversations where people are willing to listen and talk about this. And I think as the more we have those conversations, the closer we'll be getting to something that kind of helps heal this whole process. But again, making those tribes, those indigenous peoples, the communities in this area feel like they're part of that conversation no matter where they reside right now. So I think this would be a, a progress. And I think different entities and different groups are gonna get there at different points. And I think the idea with the IG is that we all recognize that we're working in the same direction and trying to remove some of the bureaucracy with our entities so that we're not having to have groups go to one entity to ask for something to another one and then again like Carmen said volunteering your time and using your time um, in this process that's been repeated kind of broken promises from these entities and hopefully we do a better job of, of working with them to achieve that. <coughs> yes yeah, so I know uh, two cities has been identified as sister cities right one is Japan one is northern Colorado uh, there is a uh, cultural exchange part of it. Yes, so we have three sister cities. Oh, three. We okay. have uh, Ciudad Guzman in Mexico and Chino, Japan. Oh, Chino. And then we also have the Northern Arapaho. And we've done student exchanges as well. Uh, last month in November, we had firefighters from Ciudad Guzman that came down and they did training with our firefighters. And then the city of Longmont donated a fire truck to them. Um, so we surprised them with that. Uh, we've had youth exchange from each community uh, with the Northern Arapaho uh, because of the issues around boarding schools and the trust. We've handled the way that we bring in the students in a different way. The first time, um, all 10 of them stayed at my house. <laughs> so, uh, and then the second time, we had them stay at the youth center. Um, so we make adjustments that are culturally appropriate, and Sister Cities is a nonprofit. It's funded, uh, some of its funding comes from City Council to shepherd these relationships. If you know about Sister Cities, I didn't know this till I accidentally got involved. Um, it, it was started by Dwight Eisenhower as a way to repair relationships with countries that we had been in conflict with. And so when uh, the mayor at the time, Mayor Bagley said, <coughs> You know anything about the tribes that were here? And I said yes. And he said, told me about sister cities. I said, well, we've been at war with uh, 
tribes, communities for about 500 years. So maybe it would be okay to start that relationship. And he's actually the one that really started having that conversation. So we, we do cultural exchanges. This last time we showed the documentary and then we had a panel discussion. Uh, we brought in uh, folks from um, Northern Arapaho. Uh, the Saturday before, Northern Arapaho folks came down and they um, made fry bread, Indian tacos. They set up a, a teepee. They showed kids and their families at the youth center how to uh, set up a teepee and how a traditional buffalo hide uh, teepee would be made. So those are the kinds of things also that we think of with open space. Could we begin to bring people down to do education? There was a, um, up in Estes Park this summer, they held an Arapaho language summit where they brought elders and youth together because their language is disappearing. Like in many years, <coughs> their language is, is, it will be fading away if we don't do something. So those are opportunities that also could be hosted or brought up by uh, our open space partners. Cool. Do we know yet what our goals are for the identification of, you know, the the resources, the historical use resources like medicine and animals and you know pathways? Is it to restore access? Is it is it to just mark honor? I think those would be part of the conversations we really have. There's definitely been some asking in the past, and we've, we've talked about those, but I think one of the things we've really heard about is our rules and rights do not allow for collecting. But one of the big pieces is the idea of can the tribes come back and collect um, traditional medicinal herbs or um, plants that they, they use for um, their, their rituals and their medicine. And is there a way that we can do that in kind of a blanket piece between the different municipalities? Say, yes, during these times or these windows or in, in certain circumstances. Again, going to be probably some give and take both ways. But again, try to reduce some of the barriers for some of those asks. Um, bringing kids down and having them on land, maybe in places that aren't open to the public, but through some sort of permitting process, say these are there these times that these tribes can use these areas in certain ways that maybe. Um, we have it historically we looked at those lands being used that way. So I think it'd be part of the conversation. I think the other thing to consider is you have a northern and southern Arapaho as well as a northern Cheyenne and southern Cheyenne. The government divided them and placed them on different reservations. But the southern folks travel up to the north for their ceremonies, their sun dance in, I believe it's in July, and other ceremonies that they have. And so wouldn't it be great to be able to stop home throughout Boulder County, whether that was to uh, do education, uh, gather, or to even camp out. We haven't quite gotten to what that could look like. Those potential are all future conversations. That's great. And we're glad to hear the city's thinking about things like that. We're thinking about very similar things in my work where we have protected lands and you know, thinking about some of like access and combination and potential transfer back and all this thing. It, it, it's a big conversation yeah. and it starts out, I think, just having that trust to have the conversation to, to start with some of those pieces that we think are easy wins. And those are the good places that, again, I think, regardless of IGAs and stuff, I'd, you'll hope you'll be seeing from me in this work group, you know, signage and ideas of ways that we just do a better job to start talking about our properties in some other way than just the, the home setting and ranch aspect of these properties. I also will add that we've had Ernest House with Keystone uh, Consultants. <coughs> yes. Um, and he uh, was in charge of the State um, Indian Commission, as well <coughs> as, um, I think he's either Southern Ute or Mountain Ute. He's Ute Mountain Ute. Ute Mountain. And so he's been helping us along with this conversation uh, so that we had that representation. And I just found out that at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, their supervising ranger um, is a northern Arapaho. So I'm going to try and reach out to him and see if we can get him engaged in this effort. And that's really the other piece of this, too, is as you're talking about all these different tribes and these groups that have used this area, are we talking to the right people? And are we in our little vacuum, even with everything? Carmen brings to this is pretty much a bureaucratic group of people having this conversation about what we need to do to help repair this and making sure that we 
are working with the tribes, those individuals, to make sure what we're trying to do meets their needs as well. It's a very humbling effort. <laughs> Any other questions? Jeff, did you have a question? Or you're just this, think, this is the thinking post. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, thank both you. of you, for sharing this. And yeah. um, we'll keep definitely, questions. hopefully, we can keep it in future agendas as, as appropriate. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Carmen, that's not your jacket. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Kayla, do you want to yeah. jump up here? Do you need to sit hey, I, I can move out of the way. Whatever works. <coughs> yeah. do, do you need them here? Uh, I wouldn't mind plugging this one. Uh, is that too complicated? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Where are we going? Can I send you a Are you sure? Yeah. You can sit on the L drive or something. Mm -hmm. uh, on the chair point, yeah. Uh, you can go to the crab. And while they're doing that, just real quick, I'm going to check over here. Has met Taylor in the past? Hi, yeah, I'm Taylor. Volunteer um, coordinator. Volunteer coordinator. She's been doing a phenomenal job. Um, if you recall, we started this position. Danielle Cassidy was the one that really started. Um, rebuilding the volunteer program. She was a part-time in that position. I think she laid some really good foundation in getting some systems in place and really did a great job of building the foundation. Oh, Taylor came in and actually brought her skill set, her connection. Um, she may talk a bit more about where she came from and all the connections she does have, but um, she has really been able to build that foundation. This, this thing's taken off with her going in. Again, today I was in a meeting. Every time someone says we have a problem, we don't have funds, we don't have people in We'll do it with volunteers and Taylor will take care of it. There you go. And then uh, documents, volunteer program. And let's see. Scroll up. Try to do see. Oh, wait. Nope, I'm sorry, back. Uh, annual impact reports. There we go. Uh, yeah, I guess so. 2022, in the 2021 folder. Perfect. And actually, she's sorry here, I'm not sure how far along she got this, but that's one of the things when I get staff to do um, end of year reports. A lot of times those numbers are coming in until the end of the year. So this is probably a little bit of a rush for you to do this stuff. I appreciate you pulling things together quickly for us. No, it was actually, it was a good deadline for me. I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, so I'm Taylor. Uh, a little background about me. I, I know I introduced myself about a year ago um, for my last volunteer impact report. Um, I was relatively new then. Um, but yeah, some background. I, right out of college, started doing volunteer coordination stuff um, with Wildlands Restoration Volunteers. Uh, I have a degree in natural resource management um, from CU. Uh, so I work with Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, which is, we'll get into it a little bit, but they're a, a local nonprofit, um, the biggest in the state and the region for trails and restoration work. Um, so I was their volunteer manager for two years, then I left and did wildland firefighting for a couple years, came back and did uh, more volunteer management and rest restoration project coordination with Wildlands Restoration Volunteers again. And then I spent uh, the last year and a half before I uh, started here uh, for City of Boulder. I was their volunteer services field lead. Um, so I was doing all of the field stuff, which was interesting because it was kind of the, the start of COVID time. So it was an unusual, it turned into an unusual job. But um, I've been here since July 2021. So a year and a half almost. Um, yep, yeah, let's keep going. So, yeah, it just looks good. So these are similar, it starts with similar sl slides to last year. I have not changed the program vision or program goals. So I'll just run through these really quickly. Um, connecting our community with our natural resources by protecting natural resources, respecting our natural environment, furthering our community identity, providing experiential opportunities, educating a new generation of stewards, protecting what we value, and promoting a sustainable and resilient long, long run today and into the future. These are, yeah, I've changed none of this. This is in the, uh, the master plan for the program, and I see no need to 
I'll take these. I think they're great. Same with program goals. Preserve and enhance our parks and natural resources. Shape the identity of Longmont. Provide connections. Provide passive, low-impact recreation compatible with resource protection goals. And embrace public engagement. Uh, this is a neat picture. This is, I think, in September. Did a native seed collection at Ralph Price Reservoir um, up at Button Rock. Lots of happy faces. So, uh, this year we wrapped up our big GoCo grant. This was a grant we did with Wild Rose Restoration Volunteers, um, the same organization I used to work at. Uh, as I mentioned, they are a huge nonprofit for uh, exactly the kind of thing that my program does. They do restoration work and habitat work and uh, forestry work and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, and it happened to be in Longmont, which is really, really fortunate for us. Um, the grant was through GOCO, so Great Outdoors Colorado. That's uh, lottery funds, basically, that get directed and funneled towards uh, outdoor work. Uh, it's a COVID relief grant. So it was our grant 2021-2022. It's about 219K. Uh, and in total, we did 43 projects and trainings through that grant with WRB. Um, a major perk of working with Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, they have been around since 1999. They've been either in Boulder or Longmont that entire time. So they have a really deep well of volunteers. They're really well established. They have thousands of volunteers. Um, and they run like 250 projects a year or something wild like that. So they're a really good resource for us to tap into as far as getting new faces and new people on board with, with what we're doing. Um, but that grant's over now. So we'll get into what that's gonna look like next year and going forward. Um, but we have a lot of money the past couple of years that we're going to be missing <coughs> next year um, and following year. So uh, this is a picture from a watering plant watering project at Macintosh Lake sometime this summer. I can't quite remember. Um, nice selfie close up of me. Um, Event types. So, uh, a lot of this is stuff we've been doing for years. Um, citizen science stuff. So, uh, we've done, we did some macroinvertebrate uh, data collection, um, also some species monitoring, that kind of thing. Fence construction and deconstruction um, in a variety of places. Landscape beds, uh, mulching projects. Uh, so, this is primarily what Parks uses the volunteer program for. is mulching landscape beds because it is something that takes staff, you know, potentially weeks to cover a park and it can, a good volunteer group can knock it out in a few hours. Uh, prairie dog barrier, uh, we just did one of those this year, but little barrier construction, fever tree painting, uh, more landscape bed renewal, noxious weed eradication, restoration plantings and maintenance, seed cleaning and seed collection, uh, and we'll use those seeds in uh, future restoration projects. Uh, shrub and tree plantings, trash cleanups, trail building, seeding projects, and tool maintenance. This is a trail project up on Sleepy Line Trail of Button Rock. We did a lot of work up there this year. Um, other program we do, educational classes, uh, kickoff events and signups, uh, trainings, and the volunteer appreciation event at the end of the year. Um, this is Citizen Science Phenology Law Training. So this is a new program we had this year um, where we, we put together a, it's called a phenology trail at Rogers Grove. And we located a few different species, plant species. And we had a group of volunteers go back regularly week after week and take phenology data or like seasonal data for each of those plants and tell us when there was bud burst and when the leaves fell off, things like that. Um, and then they submit their data, and it goes into a big national database that tracks <coughs> trends throughout the country. Um, and tens of thousands of volunteers contribute to that nation, uh, nationwide effort. Um, so it's cool data to have nationwide, and it's also great data for our open space or uh, ecosystem <coughs> management staff to have. So it tells us kind of exactly what's going on right here uh, in town. Uh, and then on the right, we have the community bird walk. These are some educational events we did this year. I think we did five or six. Um, and we just go out for 
an hour and a half in the morning. It's a cool perk for volunteers. Uh, we get our wildlife staff to come out and we go to different uh, open space locations each time and we teach them how to bird. And we see what we see. We loan out scopes and we loan out binoculars and it's a, it's a neat opportunity. People, they filled every single time. So we hope to do more of that next year. Ongoing programs. So these are, rather than like single day events, one time events, uh, these are the programs we have that we run on more of a shift basis. So people come week after week or month after month um, to contribute to these programs. Rose gardeners, breeding bird monitors, raptor monitors, the adopt a park, clean up, green up, keep long up, beautiful program. That's, those are all sort of part of a, basically a trash cleanup effort. Trail ambassadors, park and trail renewal, photographers, and citizen science, which is that phenology law. Uh, the asterisks are for trail ambassadors and citizen science because those are, uh, those were new this year. So we added those programs um, because the opportunity presented itself in, in different ways. And so we ran sort of small pilot programs for each of those uh, this year. Uh, this is uh, this is Elisa from, she's uh, one of our park techs at uh, Roosevelt. Uh, she works at the Rose Garden. She runs, kind of runs the ship at the Rose Garden. So this is at a mulching event in the spring. And she was helping stage mulch as we were getting down. Uh, and that's actually one really great thing we did this year is we sort of figured out how to work. I figured out how to work with uh, staff, uh, park staff, open space staff. We built better relationships and they sort of learned how to better work with volunteers and how to help me run volunteer events. Um, so that's something we made a lot of progress with this year, is just getting better organized, getting everyone on staff on the same page with volunteers. All right, this is the interesting stuff. Impact metrics. So here's what we did this year, or some of what we did this year. A little over 3,000 linear feet of trail maintained. 675 linear feet of new trail or rerouted trail, 330 linear feet of closed trail, 225 cubic yards of mulch and landscape beds. Uh, it's hard to visualize that. It's a lot. It's like uh, maybe like a dozen dump trucks or something. It's a lot of mulch. Uh, 1,350 gallons of trash removed. I think that's a conservative figure. It's hard to sort of measure gallons of trash. Um, but something around there. Rose Garden, 18 ongoing volunteers, 260 volunteer hours. Both of those numbers are a little bit up from last year, but I don't really see them changing. We're taking good care of the Rose Garden. We don't need 50 volunteers there. Um, ecological restoration, 730 plugs and trees planted, 405 feet of fencing built, 400 feet of fencing removed. 4,300 gallons of water fed to native shrubs and trees, 65 acres of invasive species removal, 298 acres of habitat benefited, seven species of seed collected for future restoration, and volunteer surveys, 99% satisfied, satisfied or very satisfied. I had one unsatisfied, and it was an educational program run by an external party, and frankly, it was unsatisfying. So it was a fair, it was a fair. Uh, some fair feedback. Um, this is from a Prairie Dog Area event at Blue Skies Park we did this year. Wildlife monitoring, breeding bird survey. Uh, so this is a year-round program, so this is just year-to-date stats. Um, they'll look a little bit different by the time we hit the end of the year, but not too much. Um, sorry, that first bullet point is a little bit unnecessary. <laughs> But we did 38 site visits, 50 <coughs> volunteers, 154 volunteer hours, and four properties monitored. Um, raptor monitoring, that's a much bigger effort. That goes throughout the summer, and it's a bigger group. So we did 304 site visits, 16 volunteers, 164 volunteer hours. We monitored six raptor species, uh, monitored 28 nests, and worked on 12 open spaces, nature areas, and other area density limits and 98% success rate for this. Oh, and this is, this is a neat picture. We have one raptor monitor. We have a couple that take really beautiful pictures, but this guy in particular takes incredible pictures, um, which is really cool. 
Trail Ambassador Pilot Program. So this is, again, one of our new programs. Um, <coughs> we had some volunteers request this program, so we gave it a try. Um, 55 site visits, six volunteers. Actually, you know what, let me explain this program a little bit. I wrote about it in here. Um, so yeah, new program, it's a pilot version, so it's, it's small. We kept it small so that we could learn some lessons without uh, hopefully having too much of a, an impact in either direction. Um, so we did a training with myself and with Bryce. He's the lead ranger um, out at Union. Uh, and we taught them how to have positive, uh, welcoming, helpful interactions with members of the public. Um, and then we sent them to parks and greenways. And we sent them, we, we stocked them with backpacks that had like doggy bags and um, leashes, spare leashes, uh, bike repair kits, band-aids, spare water bottles, trail maps, just kind of helpful things. Um, and they collected visitor data, like how many dogs they saw, how many rule <coughs> violations they saw, uh, how many bicyclists they saw, what, uh, what parks and amenities they were using and not using. Um, and they reported maintenance issues that they came across in parks as well, um, which is really helpful because staff are, you know, staff are limited, they can't have eyes everywhere. So having some extra eyes in our parks and greenways is really helpful. Um, we have a feedback a season review meeting tomorrow. I wish we'd had it before this so I could tell you what our trail ambassadors thought of the program. Hopefully they enjoyed it. Um, but that will sort of, their feedback will sort of guide what we do next year, whether we want to keep it small or expand or if they hated it, well, you know, maybe we cut the program entirely. Um, we'll see. But they did, uh, they had a big impact as far as I'm concerned. So those six volunteers contacted 186 people in total. Um, you can see most of it was visitor hospitality, so just <coughs> welcoming people, talking to people, um, asking what they're doing with their parks, how they're using the parks. Uh, and then 20 of them were visitor assistants. Um, so, you know, band-aids or helping fix a bike tire, whatever. Uh, five other, I don't know what those are. Um, 43 violations observed, and in our report, they detailed exactly what those violations were. So we can see at any given park, uh, you know, if there's a pattern, we're seeing a lot of people, or a lot of dogs off leash in one particular area that can potentially guide us to put a sign up in that location, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, 37 maintenance concerns reported, um, which then went to park staff so that they could take a look. Uh, 21 locations visited throughout the city. So that's, uh, that's the gist for our Trail Ambassador program. I will keep you guys in the loop on feedback from volunteers to see how they liked it and what changes they might have for next season. The other new one uh, I described a little bit, Citizen Scientist, the Phenology Walk out at Rogers Grove, some species that they monitored for phenology data. Um, and that's a year-round program, so that's not just through the warm months. We want winter data as well. So. 42 site visits, five volunteers, 96 volunteer hours, six plants and five animals regularly monitored. Um, and yeah, that's, that's happening right now. So we are gonna do a winter feedback session at some point, we're gonna wait till after the holidays. Um, we already have folks who are, well, we have two of those volunteers have COVID right now, and so that would get to the holidays before we, <laughs> before we met in person. Um, oh, and this is, this is a picture from, well, these are both pictures from Trail Ambassadors. Uh, so this is one of the contacts that one of ours had with the guy with the really big fish. I don't actually know where that was, but <laughs> I was just going to ask. Yeah. 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 Remind me about this one there. What? Remind me about this one. So yeah, this is this is the the big the big slide. So uh, this shows our numbers over the past few years. Twenty twenty is on there. It's obviously a little bit of an outlier. That was like prime COVID time and also, you know, a, a part-time volunteer coordinator. So things look a little bit different. But um, really, I'm using 2021 as our baseline. Um, and you can see we, we had some big increases from 2021. So we went from 44 volunteer events to 70 <coughs> volunteer events, which is a 59% increase uh, from 708 volunteers to a little over a thousand for a 49% increase. 
uh, about the same number of community partners, uh, 3,418 service hours to 4,645, uh, 4, uh, which is what, a 36% increase, and value of volunteer time increased uh, 42%. So we had some really good numbers this year. Um, I'll get into that a little bit on the next slide, um, but or I guess in a few slides. But really, I think with these numbers, they're awesome. They're, I think, what the uh, sort of carrying capacity of our program is right now. Um, we were able to accomplish all of the goals that we had set out for in the spring, and then we sort of moved the goalposts, and we were able to accomplish almost all um, our project goals once we moved those goalposts. So. We got a lot of work done. Um, I, I think my understanding is that parks and open space, natural resource staff are, are really happy with what the volunteer program was able to do this year. Um, however, this is this is sort of, we hit our max. This is, I think, right now with the resources we have, and by resources, in this case, really, I mean one staff member. That's about as much as I can do. Um, so. Uh, these are just some more pictures. I don't need to explain every one of them, but there's some cool. We did some little <coughs> some of the fence we built at uh, Dickens Farm Nature Area. We're gonna try to. This area has been totally trampled, so we'll try to restore it. Um, invasive species removal. This was at a seed collection. The water was really flowing, so we got a cool picture. Um, another seed collection. Some more raptors. Um, beaver tree painting. <coughs> This is Rose Garden, uh, the with pruning, doing cut back of the roses. Some trail work stuff, uh, watering out at Macintosh. Uh, a few pictures from some of our planting projects at Macintosh Lake. Uh, got a, a tree cover here. Happy volunteers, check in process, some trash collection with a very cute family. Um, and there are a lot more <coughs> cool pictures where that came from. If you want another thousand pictures, just let me know. Um, lessons learned 2022. So, one, July and August, it's been this way for five years, and it's time to sort of acknowledge that it's more than just a one-time thing. They're too hot for most outdoor events. People do not want to be outside when it's 95 degrees out. And these days, it is consistently 95 degrees out. Um, I sort of planned for it this year, and I did sort of a light load of projects. Um, and even those were really hard to recruit for. So next year, I'm gonna plan for it even more um, and really just do indoor stuff, educational stuff, um, because people really do not want to volunteer their time to do outdoor labor when it's super hot out. And if we end up with a cool July and August, great, we'll plug in some, some more projects, but something to plan for next year. I went over this a little bit. We hit current program carrying capacity for events and most ongoing opportunities. That's in my opinion. Um, and at this time, we don't have program resources to expand further. That means there's just me. And without GoCo funding, now that that grant um, is complete, uh, at this time, we don't have funding to do more events next year than, than what we've been able to do. Um, and in fact, we don't have funding to do all of the events that we did this year. So. And I'll get into this on the next page, but one of the goals for next year is going to be to find some more funding. Um, recruitment. Uh, one lesson learned for me, program promotion is a lot more successful <coughs> than asking for volunteer help. So uh, I've been working with comms on this. We're putting together a cool comms plan for next year. Just like getting folks excited about the stuff we're doing, putting together videos and interviews with volunteers, cool before and after pictures. That kind of thing has proven to be a lot more successful than just posting saying, hey, we need help with this project. Um, so that's something we'll be doing a little bit more of next year. Um, and hopefully we'll be more visible um, in that way as well. A uh, successful new interagency volunteer coordinator collaboration effort. Kind of a mouthful. Um, basically, I, I worked with uh, a, an old colleague of mine at City of Boulder, um, Open Space and Mountain Parks, and we put together <coughs> a group of volunteer coordinators from a number of local uh, agencies. So we've got several folks from Boulder County. We've got Open Space and Mountain Parks uh, at Boulder. We've got Boulder Parks and Rec in the odd city of Louisville, myself. And we get together quarterly and 
we're able to sort of pass volunteers. Like if I have a project that, or if I have volunteers that I can't find a project for, I'll send them over to them. Um, or like, for example, we have a lot of restoration work to do in the coming years at Button Rock, and we do not have enough land to connect or to collect enough native seed to do that work at Button Rock. So we'll be working with Sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> can't breathe in that thing. Um, so we'll be uh, working with Boulder County and City of Boulder and doing some seed collections on their properties um, to gather enough seed so we can do that restoration work. Um, so that's, that's been a cool new thing that we're doing. Um, we are hitting high project and volunteer numbers, um, which means that in some cases, in my opinion, program development, capacity building, community building, some of that stuff suffers because I'm in the field. I'm, I was averaging three days a week in the field every week, um, which means I didn't have enough time, in my opinion, for really solid recruitment work. Um, really solid, uh, like reaching out, trying to do capacity building stuff, volunteer appreciation stuff, responding to volunteers. I tried to respond within a day, and I wasn't able to do that because I was in the field so much. So some of those sort of behind the scenes pieces that I think are really important to make making a program feel um, feel like it's really, really well organized and well done and the community is really solid. I wasn't able to do all of those pieces, um, but we hit some really good numbers. So trying to find, I think, you know, in every program there's a balance between um, you know, any number of things. I think next year I'd like to bring the balance back a little bit from doing as many projects as possible and, and bring it back towards building community and building, building some more capacity into the program. So I'd like to move that back a little bit. Um, we are still gathering volunteer feedback from the new programs, as I mentioned, so I don't have a ton of in, uh, info there. 2023 and beyond. So, current staff resources, volunteer program, cannot support expanded programs or an increase in projects. Uh, <coughs> we're looking into a possible season employee in 2023. Has not been approved by city council yet, but I have my fingers crossed. That would be huge for the program. It would mean that Ideally, with the right person in there, we could they could do some of the, the field work, and I could be behind the scenes doing a little bit more recruitment and, again, the capacity building stuff. So it would give us space to do everything I want to for the program. Um, oh, and find funding, because that's that's going to be a significant piece. Because GoCo com is complete, so we need additional funding in 2023. Um, Greater focus on community building and program capacity building. Gone over that. Um, potential expand, expansion of trail ambassador programs and gardener programs. Um, so right now we run the Rose Gardener program. Um, we have two native pollinator demo gardens coming in, one at Rogers Grove, one at the Visitor Center at Sandstone. And I'd like to run native garden programs in the same way we run our Rose Garden program. Um, we also have a greenhouse that is currently being built out back, or maybe is practically done? Almost done. Okay, Great. we're getting there. <laughs> um, and we'll have volunteers help maintain uh, some of our plants in the greenhouse as well. Um, so those are some new ongoing things that are, that are coming up. And then this is sort of insider inf information, kind of. Um, Thor Nature Experience is uh, here in Boulder, and they do, it's a, a nonprofit group, and they do a lot of programming with youth. And there's a there's something called Nature Kids <coughs> Lafayette, and they're coming up with uh, Nature Kids Longmont uh, in the coming year or two. And I've been, uh, the person who's going to be starting that up is, is an old colleague of mine, and we're, we're hoping to get a, a consistent partnership with youth from that program um, and the work we did here at Longmont. So that's a pretty cool thing that's coming up, uh, because I would love to engage more youth um, and especially if it's a consistent group uh, of folks that come back week after week. I think that would be a pretty cool opportunity for us and for them. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. And if we have questions, thanks. Of course. Yeah. Any questions? 
supporting this. Karen? Um, who's the person, who's your friend at Future Kids Long Month? A uh, new employee there, um, Rachel Brett. Oh, well, Rachel Brett has been, yeah, she's not new. Okay. Good. Uh, new, new to new, okay. 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 Not new in, okay, I've worked yeah. for Rachel for the last, yeah, six, seven years. Okay. Rachel's been at WRB for, yeah, five, six, okay. seven years. Okay. So, yeah. You said a seasonal employee, yeah. but not July and August. What is the season for this sort of Oh, thing? so yeah, our volunteer season is, it starts late March-ish, depending on snow and all that. Uh, it extends through through October, sometimes into November a little bit. Without that spot in the middle. Yeah, and then the, so that chunk spring. in the middle. Okay, that's a, that would yeah. be my guess. I didn't know if it was only spring or only fall. Sure. That yeah. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? David? Do you mind if I add a little bit yeah. to that? Yeah, nice job, and I just wanted to hit on a couple of those points. One was that Tump position that um, we do have some funds and we're looking at converting, because I think, um, you heard from Taylor, the other person to get more time out of the field to get that support where she can work on those grants and work on dollars to, to kind of leverage that, I think is a better use of her time. So we really are trying to push that. And in those down seasons, it's time where they can start Accumulating numbers and do some of these number crunching and work on stuff. So I don't have any problem with you know, the idea that they just work for them to do up there. And they do a lot of coordination with these projects with the parks and open space staff and where it really takes to go there and do it. So it's not just go to a beaver project. There's a lot of kind of work that they, they really do. The other piece that I was surprised Eric didn't ask and then I saw it. Um, your, your wildlife monitors. I know the volunteers and are already taking a lot of work. Is there opportunities for kids to kind of partner with some of these individuals to? Yeah, I think so. Um, as far as, you know, there's only so many nests in the city and we have them currently all covered with volunteers. Um, and we try to give folks who have volunteered with us in years past doing raptor, monitor, ma raptor monitoring first go at those nests. And for the most part, most, you know, most people come back. So, however, I do think there's an opportunity for shadowing or for like educational right. events um I, I think that's probably where the greatest opportunity is um is, is shadowing or working directly with our, our wildlife staff and doing some educational stuff in the field um teaching teaching kids how to monitor nests and we can even you know we can always double up on nests. so if we do want have a youth group who wants to go out and take over three nests even if we have volunteers who are also monitoring those nests there's no reason for an educational, I mean, we can't throw an educational component where you also monitor those nests. Right. I was just thinking about our future volunteers out there. That really yeah. Can yeah, I was going to ask that same thing because oh. I'd love to do since I looked up the nest on Is this publicly available data? Sorry? Is this publicly available data? Uh, it is not yet, but it will be. Um, it'll be on our website. And I'm handing it over to the comms team next week and we'll figure out where we'll post it. But it will be soon. Karen? Do you do raptor monitoring on private land as well? I totally know. I mean, I'm just thinking of the next door neighbors had the giant, like, red tailed hawk nest. Right. But basically, the whole neighborhood was monitoring already. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. My understanding is yes. Um, if we can <coughs> monitor from a safe place and a place that's it's far enough away from the nest but close enough that we can see what's going on in it with the scope or binoculars yes we are monitored and i think i, I believe the wildlife staff i, I think they connect with those they, they really monitors. try to for the fact that when we do um land use stuff a lot of this stuff is you know having it they're required to do your natural resource and wildlife surveys and a lot of times they look at the site they're on and we know sometimes just beyond that property line, there's nests. We don't go trespassing on people's private property, but those nests are very visible. A lot of times we can kind of ground truth things just by staying on city properties or right ways and, and getting an idea of those, those without having to, to go onto those private properties. So we don't, we don't go on private properties and monitor per se, but we do have the opportunity to do that for the most part. The, the last thing I'd like to talk about this program is the fact that you talked about seed collection and restoration work. Some of this stuff, this is a full circle sort of piece that it is really hard for seed in these projects to find the right native seed varieties, plant plugs and stuff like that from um, growers and areas. When we're doing restoration work, um, 
to have the ability to have people collecting the seeds, growing out the seeds, and then planting the seeds in our projects. This is a, I, I just think a wonderful opportunity for us to kind of create a kind of full circle of use of our volunteers and our volunteer resources, which goes back to my last point is, how can we get the question, are these just feel-good projects? Or do they really add oh, value? Sure. <laughs> and it is work that I, I would say the, how long can you dump trucks full of mulch that Timber and staff are always at the end of the year saying, we just couldn't get to it. And it's stuff that really we, is on people's work project that wouldn't probably get done. And it definitely benefits those beds, those shrubs, water conservation, those plants by having the mulch out there. So this is all from prairie dog fence to mulching. to projects that not only engage the community, but is, is work to see really needs to get done. So thank you. Congratulations on a great year. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Or are we ready to move? All right. Thanks for coming, Taylor. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. Our next agenda item is to get an update on the recreation, library, culture, funding initiative. Um, and I just, so I think Jeff's going to give us an update on the recent conversation at City Council, and then hopefully you all saw there were great questions um, for you all to consider in the packet. Um, and I would like to make sure we kind of just <coughs> go around and give everyone a chance to answer those <coughs> questions after Jeff gives his update. So it's a pretty important opportunity for us to get our feedback in at this point. So Jeff? Thank you. So on, November 29th, the uh, city manager presented to council uh, a list of projects that could be included in a uh, library, recreation, and culture tax uh, in November of next year. D did everybody get a chance to see the numbers? So I, I won't take too much time going over that because I think the three questions are most important. But uh, he presented uh, $244,700,000 worth of projects. Specifically, that's hard to say. I'm, that's <laughs> a big number. <laughs> yeah. For recreation and parks, that included um, renovation of Centennial Pool, completion of Dry Creek Community Park, uh, Montgomery Farms uh, construction, uh, a new recreation center, uh, union master plan implementation, and some updating of the existing recreation center. And, and then in, in your packet, it also talks about operating dollars and what it would cost each year to operate that. Um, he proposed to them a combination of ways to fund <coughs> the, the projects, that being both with property tax and with sales tax, um, namely that the property tax would fund the capital side of it or the, the construction, and the sales tax would provide the ongoing operation for the facilities. Again, this is all conceptual. Council did not make any decisions. Uh, their guidance was to have staff starting start to go out to the public and get input on what the public thinks should be included in the uh, uh, tax uh, that would be asked. So any questions on kind of where we're at with the project? And again, that's real quick, but really want to make sure we have question, uh, time for the, the three questions to get your input. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand the projects. This is all a cart. This is not like all both together. It will be, we believe, all a cart. All the okay. only ones that might be combined is the parks and recreation because we have some that there's a standard with within the state of those projects being together but it's our belief that each question would be asked individually so museum parks rec performing arts okay. and library okay that makes sense oh the most important thing would be one big giant scary number well, right. but i think the intent may be to do outreach and try to build public support for the package yes. Oh. Yes. and so you know get like the parks and rec community and the museum community and the library community all together to kind of advocate for because we don't want to get it into a position where 
I'm not going to vote for the museum if I don't get a new rec center and vice versa kind of thing. So a unified front, I think, is very important. Right. Yeah. Can you remind me what did we have on the ballot? Or what was the number amount on the ballot three years ago for the pool and ice in particular? Because 64 million for the rec center seemed like a big number to me, but I couldn't remember. I think it was 45. Okay. Million before. That, and that's based on is bigger. Yes, it is, but the cost of no, no, I get it. I'm just making sure I was grounded yeah. correctly. Yep. Yeah. All right, thanks. I think I'm about to restate exactly what you all just said, but I feel like in the summer when we heard this pitch originally, wasn't the idea that it was going to be a one package deal and they were going to try to get people to vote on one thing? As opposed to the a la carte idea, did something change? Well, ideally, that's how we want to do it. We are working with uh, legal staff uh, from the state that helps give guidance. And the initial guidance is, is that you're not uh, allowed to group the, the projects that they would have to be voted on individually, which was the same thing that happened in 2018 when we went to uh, an election that had a question about golf, had a question about the Civic Center, and a question about the uh, fire department. Um, and initially we wanted to bunch those together, but it wasn't allowed. But it was allowed in 2000 when we did the yes. Rec Center Museum in, and Senior Center together? Yeah, 99. Because the 99, that was together at the yeah, time. It was a, yeah, gotcha. So I guess I just, I'm trying to clarify, can we imagine it's going to say something like ballot initiative 19A is $64 million for the rec center, and then it's going to just be a laundry list and people are going to check yes or no on every project? I believe so. There, I mean, that's... No, that's fine. I just in my brain imagined we were doing the opposite from yeah. the last time that we talked about it. Well, but I wonder, I mean, because usually ballot, I mean, I'm not an expert in ballot legal language but usually it's like if they have something if they're connected so you might have like the revamp of centennial pool and the new rec center and the update of the old rec center like there might be a package of recreation facilities I would, that would be one piece yes. and then like a library that would be one piece and then museum yeah. so i That's think all that so it wouldn't be like centennial and the rec center and the, yeah yeah okay Again, that's, that's based on whatever the community is interested in. But you know where there was a, I don't remember what page it was on, but there was a part about the mill levy going up from like, I'm making up numbers, 15 to 30 or something yes. like that. That number won't be able to be stated that way if it's actually based on each question. Eh? So well, in, in the council communication, it did share how much mill levy or sales tax would need to go up by each item. Okay. Yeah. So that... Okay. Has been calculated. And so you now, staff has direction to begin planning for public outreach around this package, or like, yes. can you plan and begin implementing, or <coughs> how much direction do you feel like you have? Oh, not a lot. I think we <laughs> as a committee need to get back together again and develop a plan. But one of, one of the things that you and I and David had talked about mm -hmm. is starting to get feedback on the public process and how we do that outreach because the clock's really ticking and okay. by okay. August, council will need to determine whether they're gonna put this on the, the ballot or not. So we need to do everything in our power <clears throat> to start the, the process so that we can get moving. <coughs> yeah, though, I think they have to, but that's the latest that they can put something on the ballot. Okay. So, what we had hoped when we sort of planned for the discussion for this meeting is that this would be an opportunity for all of us. <coughs> To share thoughts on, you know, if there are particular amenities related to the rec center, recreation facilities that you really feel should be included in the community scoping, and then if there's any particular um, requests or guidance around how the outreach is conducted. 
they wanted to be able to get that thinking now, so it could be incorporated to the extent that it can be um, early in the planning. So if there's no other background questions, uh, maybe we could just go to the first question, which is what amenities should be considered to be included in a new recreation center? I'm happy to just like go down the line. Jeff, do you want to start and then we'll just go? To me, an indoor and an outdoor pool, I mean, the pool area, I think it's already said something is oldish, but I would definitely say indoor and outdoor pool. And I think Lamont's current skateboard infrastructure is very lacking. If you don't have a car, you can't use it really. It doesn't exist in most cases if they run away, or something that you can get to. And hopefully a good one. Are you thinking indoor I don't know or you. <laughs> outdoor? I'm sorry? Outdoor? Skateboarding should yes be outdoor. Well, there is indoor. Yeah, yeah. sure, that would be great. Yeah, I'm just not trying to invent a new thing. <laughs> that great, okay. That's my whole list. Great, Manoj? Is it dependent on this board, could you say? <laughs> We're just giving we just get opinions. to provide it, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Okay, the swimming is in great demand in the city, and they definitely need indoor swimming pool. <clears throat> okay. yeah. I agree on swimming, but I would also, uh, I'm not sure how, what does staff have in mind mm -hmm. by picking $64 million? That already well, that brackets. destroys this conversation if I tell you what I <laughs> Well, no, right, right. but I mean, otherwise, <laughs> no, we, we, we could name 53 things and it's 64, 64 million, billion dollars, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, somehow you had some model of a recreation center in Thornton that we're matching or in wherever, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So oh, I would say. I mean, I mean a would, gym, a pool, we could duplicate our current rec center, which I think would be a waste. Um, for example, I don't think we need another kid pool, but I would need numbers to say, oh, it's vastly oversubscribed. But I hear people are, you see in Times Call, you know, oh, there's not enough gym space. We had a guy here last week who was complaining, or last month, who complained that the volleyball folks, you know, there wasn't enough space in the gym, you know, and that kind of, and there's not enough space for swimming laps versus, you know, having a master's versus having swim lessons. So it's hard to judge. You know, I, my wish list is huge, but I think we should be guided more by demand um, outside well, this. What they're going to do is present options and gauge yeah. demand. Okay. So you should share what you think are the most important options yeah. to be vetted by the public. I think a, a lap pool and an ice rink, but well, we tried that, but I still think those two things, would, we don't have an ice rink and we need more lap pool. Especially if Centennial is going to go away. And that seemed to be part of the deal here was that Centennial was going away. So, But do we need a lap pool? It's just a question. Would the school district build in the pool? Um, I don't know. That's what you're supposed to tell me. You're the staff member who has all those numbers. No, they didn't. So that's they, what the public is going to tell us. Yeah. See, then we're saying you need to ask the public about that pool. Right. Does the public yeah. have access to Silver Beach Pool? No. Nope. So how can I don't know? No, but the district has changed its mind a little bit. All it does is take the district swim teams out of the lanes that the public use. Right. Which that's it's helpful. It's helpful. Yeah. yeah. But it's not Is there a plan for when you when the I'm sorry when the quail <coughs> if the quail Rec Center got updated to update the children's part of the pool. Because I mean, I think it, it's, it's long in the tooth at this point, isn't it? A little bit. That we're not going to add any capacity right. as far as square footage. Right. But what we'd like to do is update the the slide the area, you know, the kitty play area right. in, in there. Um, that again wouldn't add capacity, but it would add uh, a new feature that would draw more people. There. Sure. And that would be more fun for the kids right. as well. Well, back to my original point. We got a lot of positive feedback from folks about a nice rink and a pool. In particular, a lot of folks wanted a 50-meter pool, but realistically, that can't happen. 
I mean, we already went down that road and failed. So I would say that's silly to build a humongous pool, but an ice rink, I think, would be a big boon to a lot of folks. But that's a huge number <coughs> price-wise. You know, we all know that. So tricky. Well, yeah. Scott? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to kind of repeat a lot of the same things. It's just that, right. it's that you know, since Taylor comes offline, obviously, to take up that capacity. But even there, we're already we have more demand than the capacity we already have. So lanes, I think, on the pool side, or ability to do lessons, um, I think is a big part that's there. All, a lot of the other stuff that's there um, in the Cardinac Center repeat, I think there's just an overall you know, need, you know, whether it's court court space <coughs> or gym space or whatever, that's why we need the Cardinac Center, um, whether you know, each one of us uses it or, or not. I'm not the pickleball player, but you know, someone's gonna yell and scream, and we've heard it a million times that if the private market, which there doesn't seem to be money for it, because I, I personally did two market studies now for companies, um, to have something that's not court, not basketball court, pickleball facility, um, indoor, indoor, outdoor, what? Yeah, indoor. Somebody, somebody was telling us that Loveland <coughs> just opened at its indoor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Indoor has has one. Uh, I mean, Loveland has one out there. But um, yeah, it's just it. Um, for the most part, the ones that are opening are people who can't rent their facilities, and so those property owners are going to, you know, basically white label their building, they put them <coughs> in courts, and then they run with it. So like the one that's in Westminster is like that. The guy's losing money on it, um, but because <coughs> there's just not enough density of people. Uh, so it's get, way up to 17 from Pace's vacant. It's, 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 oh, it's I mean, like you want to pay 60,000 square feet. That's, yeah, there's a lot of pickle off. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> you know, if somebody came in, you know, to split it or something, I mean, you needed 24, 20, 20,000 square, 20, 25,000 square foot space. It would be great, but it is, it is a, it's a, it's a market of people who are, are price conscious, and um, as soon as it's nice outside, we'll play for free. So it's a, it's a tough market to beat. But right now, Longmont's group, which is over a thousand people now, um, in that meetup, they are screaming every time the weather hits forty degrees or it rains or snows. They're all cursing out the city. That we don't. We're not. Heard that. That we're not <laughs> proactive. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just like, calm down, people. Because we, we, I pulled them a bunch of times. Like, what would you pay for a private place? And basically, comes back with, not enough. And so that's why there isn't. That's why there aren't more private spots. It has to be public private. And the right. see is yeah, losing keep money keep left and right. And the tennis players in the exactly. same bunch. Right. Yeah. So not to take it over, right. but you know, that sort of thing. I mean, you don't make money on the skate parks either. So it's those type of things that the city has to provide because the market the, the market can't provide some of that stuff. The other side on pool, sunset is chaos, obviously, during the middle of summer. And sunset like pool somewhere else in the city would be super fantastic for the kids to go to. Um, my only question overall, which we didn't quite get to when we get to the list, is what, what I mean, where how does this happen if we place a rec center somewhere? Would it affect development of one or two of these other places that are on this list, right? Well, Harold, Harold, Harold in his he said dry he creek. said dry creek. Yeah, that's that it. was <coughs> that's his spot. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, so it's dry creek, fifty nine million dollars plus sixty four million dollars for rec center. Is it well? Dry is, creek is supposed to be expanded to a second phase. Is that what you're talking about? And uh, whatever that yeah, is. The, the numbers for Dry right. Creek are incorrect. Oh, okay. Because there's yeah. such a yeah, giant yeah, number yeah, for, we for open space. We, as a part of our next meeting, mm -hmm. need to talk about the numbers and yeah, how how they were <coughs> further developed and what we present. Okay. That, that's a piece, too. We talked about some of the, the Herald's desire to have these eight parks done in Five years um, with some work that Steve has been working on, and those this all kind of uh, play a little bit with each other too. So again, we had some questions about Dry Creek and Montgomery Farms on there. Montgomery Farms is really on our list because if it ended up with a rec center there, we definitely would be then 
trying to coordinate the building of that park with that rec center too. So um, we, we definitely have some clarification and um, as you talk about choosing pencil sharpening of those numbers too. Um, well, echoing what Jeff, what a few people said, outdoor pool and indoor pool, indoor outdoor pool, had one when I was a kid that thought I thought was the coolest thing that you could swim outdoors and you swimming, the 70s, like you would swim up through the tunnel to get to the outdoor part and you'd swim out like it'd be snowing and you'd swim out of, <coughs> like in Missouri, it was like the coolest thing. Um, yeah, for ideas, giving you ideas not just stay in conventional on here. Um, I want bus access. Um, I want bus and bike access really big because I don't want it to be a parking lot and I don't want us to be using our our precious land for parking as much. Um, and I'm not sure what our numbers are in climbing, but Everybody I know in um, south of here, it just the climbing gyms are just so packed. South of here, like Lafayette, Louisville, <coughs> um, Boulder, just so packed and more climbing facilities, um, especially as we get more young adults moving in. Um, not sure exactly what what the offer the amenities are going to be offered in the museum the library um, sphere, but. If the museum doesn't get their kitchen, we need kitchen space. People want to do cooking classes. There are no places to do cooking classes in, um, in this area at all. Um, we need um, maker spaces. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, it's Great British Bake Off, Great Longmont Bake Off. I'll be a judge. Thanks. I just want to eat the cookies. And um, like multi generational crafting areas would be good. Um, you know, crochet groups, like different people to come in. There's a lot of group meeting space that's not there. Um, youth meeting space, and not like we have, every place has like a meeting, I'm not disparaging this meeting space, but we can't see each other and it's not in a circle. And so kind of go back to the seventies and have like places where people can meet and have conversations and things like that. Because, you know, the library has these bookshelves in the middle of you, like if you're trying to meet with four people or whatever. And I think that's a, a big thing. And those could be the new library. They could be the new museum. But we got to coordinate with those because it's all recreation. It's all learning. And I think those are all going to be. Um, and then, oh, back to the, the pool. Somebody mentioned it. But here's, like, as a former 20-year swim teacher, designated lessons like a lesson space for swim pool swimming that was designed by instructors because you need certain depths and you need kids to be able to kind of hop off stuff and things like that in a decent temperature for kids really makes them learn exponentially better when the temperature would go up your kids your kids put their faces in the water and then they swim so yeah, those are, that's a long list. Sorry. Yeah. Can I ask you a question related to what she just asked? Oh. Is there a maker space in any of the city of Longmont infrastructure or the yeah, arts district? Does that exist anywhere? Other than like the, the tinker mill? No, no. But there, that would be something that the library would consider as part of their convention. Okay. Oh, I think the museum had kind of considered a little bit of a unique space as well. That's going to be the interesting part of this. Like, once you get the community <clears throat> feedback on the amenities, like, which amenities go right. where? The museum is further ahead than all of us because they do have a design with uh, what their expansion would look like. Um, but, you know, the, the rec center and the branch library are a clean space. <clears throat> And was the branch library was going to be part of the rec center or yeah. part of the revamp of Centennial? It would be a, a part of the new rec center. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this this question was good for me, uh, interesting for me to answer because I, um, current table, I'm not a frequent user of the current rec center. Um, I'm, it's not my my go to spot. But we're thinking through this, I thought like, okay, who is the recreation center most valuable for our community? Like. Um, 
who has the biggest impact by having this? And I really think that it probably comes down to teenagers and young adults. In my mind, right, like having a safe place for teenagers to go after school, to hang out, um, that's like pretty, pretty important. So as, you know, putting myself in the shoes of a teenager coming into a rec center after school, what kind of programming would I want to have there? And it's probably a lot of boring stuff. It's probably like foosball and like ping pong tables, right? Like just places to hang out and talk with other teenagers, right? Um, so it's kind of a my brain that. And then maybe also some like some programming too, if like, I don't know, um, uh, team sports of sorts that are more intramural, like that, and easy to access. So it's kind of a my brain that. Um, well, I had a lot of the things people have said. I mean, I do think we need to scope the full range of swimming, so recreational, lab, indoor, outdoor. You know, I think we really need to get a sense of what is needed. I also think we need to continue to scope the ice sheet, like a recreational indoor ice sheet of some sort, until we have one. We need to keep asking about opportunities. And I do think there are there are a range. I've seen many different iterations of the way those things are handled anywhere from like, you know, old sort of military facilities that are converted to really high-end facilities that have like restaurants and then just like the whole range. Um, I'm intrigued by the idea of like dedicated sports courts. It was kind of interesting when we heard from the the gentleman at the meeting last time about the conflicts and I just I've been working out at the rec center more lately as it's gotten colder and definitely and there's always lots of people on the basketball courts and the you know the volleyball and so I wonder if people would be interested in having dedicated like this is where the basketball courts are these are volleyball courts these are I think it's worth looking into um, and then I had similar questions about community meeting space, whether that was something people wanted to be able to have. Um, various iterations of that, and I also wondered about farming. Whether, I never see anyone on a farming wall at the rec center, but I know there is a big farming community. Oh, that's why, okay. Yeah. Phew, why is it going to see anybody? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're trying to hire staff. <laughs> LCC pays better. Yeah. yeah, and there is and the, the same with baby collective right or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So same. I don't know what the demand is, but I think it's worth asking. They're building a giant, giant. Are they massive? massive? Yeah. Okay. Well, so yeah. maybe we don't yeah. need to duplicate. Yeah. But I don't know. But like I, I can't afford to go to. I mean, seriously, yeah. I I can't mm -hmm. go for one visit to the one not climbing the collective. Like I'm not in that bracket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never been. You can't afford it. Yeah. You work for a nonprofit. You yeah. either it, and you have a family. Like you can't have both. You can't yeah. work for a nonprofit or have a family. But you can't have both and go. So crazy. Okay. So that's I think a good list. Does it yeah. resonate with kind of what you were thinking? Yes. Yep. Okay. So yeah. Real quick, just this was on kind of on the record that uh, the piece I did hear that I have not heard in a long time was the kind of certified kitchen. And it's something that I spent probably 10 years in the county. So the county has some efforts in that. Um, there was some, there was some really some conflict between the private sector and that too. So I can talk to Jeff a little bit um, and then about, you know, kind of the work that maybe <coughs> people are already looking at because it really was a, a desire for the community, but also our local farmers. They would love to have places where they could extend their seasons by canning and doing that kind of stuff too. So there's definitely need up there. I don't know if you'd be tied to this, but I can share that information with Jeff. That'd be a good thing to dive into, Jeff, would be the update to the county fairgrounds because they're uh, rebuilding yeah. the buildings and they could very well be their concessionary there actually is a certified meeting spaces, things like that. <laughs> I would forgot I would also put in another plug for the just looking at whether skateboarding like there's another facility that. could be co-located with something because I do sandstone so far away and so hard to access and everything else is really small well the bus access not mixed up yeah the bus really access one. yeah Aaron, go ahead. the one behind the rec center is not usable I see that there all the time. Really? I, never I go to the there. tennis court and there's always two really? kids there every time. Maybe same three kids. Could be, <laughs> I don't know. I it's a little 
I mean, it's a little bleak even by skateboarder standards. Yeah. Ah, okay. um, yeah, like, Thanks. I mean, my husband, who's king of bleak, like, it's his life. He's like, oh, like, hurts my soul. Yeah. Uh, I'll drive right home tonight, and there'll be people at Sandstone. Oh, yeah. And then it'll be snowing. It, it's the one spot you can buy, no matter yeah. what time it is, there are people at these facilities. It's a good facility. facility. It's just hard to. It's hard, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Especially for younger kids. And we tried to get bus access there, but RTD won't operate outside Polis County. They yeah. County. We've worked on that for decades, yes. and they won't they won't send a bus bus out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Transportation yeah. issue. Yeah. Hold it, bus conversation. I mean, it would be fun to have, like if we start treating big, have a snow train. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, they, they have in Denver. Like, there's in Denver, there's snow train, and it's connected to it's connected the skate park. Huh. Like. And just when it snows, I mean, when it snows, like people try to beat the snow plows on the on the paths, like they'll be trying to beat to get get their skis out. But people try to make Sunset Hill into a train park <coughs> sometimes. It might be kind of fun, a little bit, like a little train. Oh, Okay, so the next question <laughs> is on public outreach. So suggestions. Or public outreach, um, in terms of like who should be focus, who should who should be focused for public outreach? What kind of public outreach tools? So there's like surveys, focus groups, you know, sort of in person questions. Where, um, so any thoughts you have about how public outreach should be conducted? Feels like the second and third question go together. Should we really keep them apart still? I mean, well, the third one. Yeah, the third one seemed really similar to me. So. My answer for the second one is my answer to the third one. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say my one answer, which is to me, I feel like we get a lot of. I feel like the newspaper is a great way to get people to be engaged. So I would recommend some sort of Times Call related advertisement and just as a way to like. Whatever we whatever we choose, whether it's a public meeting or whatever, it seems like there's a lot of engagement through that. So that's just my one idea. Okay. Uh, sports group, uh, community groups, next door neighborhood, <coughs> and then surveys. Surveys. Okay. Um, I don't have a really good idea because last time we had a, a couple of big meetings at the senior center and it's all folks who are already gung-ho um, and so I mean I'm think, I guess I'm thinking more of advertise I'm trying to get it passed before or design it so it will pass and so we need more outreach <coughs> early I mean, choosing a location is going to turn some people off. And the fact that we have to put these down as an itemized list is going to be a problem. The one we passed in 99 passed because everybody could see a net benefit. And now it's, I think it's, it feels to me, even not knowing anything, that it's going to be too easy to say, yay, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I'll use these three things, but not those. So that it's going to be the lawyers coming back are going to be a tricky problem for us, and so um, you know I don't know how you say vote for all. I mean, which is what we're going to want to say, you know, as a, I mean, <laughs> in, you know, we as a board, park board, want to do the parks thing or the recreation thing, but we can't just hang the other guys out to dry, and and so this is really going to be a problem. I mean. I don't, and I don't know how to get around it. Um, the, the whole, if you say like that, we must keep these separate. That's that's really hard. And uh, I understand the the staff, and especially it wasn't Harold. me making the decision. No, no, no. I, I get it, <laughs> and, and, and I understand that Harold is constrained or feels constrained right. by this. But um, this feels like it needs to be a huge effort to try to wheedle that somehow. Um, otherwise, we're in trouble right from the beginning. We're going to have the same problem we did three years ago, where people are going to say in a macroscopic way, oh, competitive, I see that works, I'm done. And people are going to say, 
that much for a library that I never walk in? No way. Or for a rec center or for whatever. And I want this to, I mean, it just feels, so for me, that means public outreach to Herald to try to gang them together or to everything really early because we're doing this as a package. It looks like it's a bunch of different things, but it's a package, you know, right. and I don't know how we say that. Yeah, program. I don't know how we say that, but that, and again, that's just my opinion, but that's based on the 20 some year ago version and the three year ago version, you know, what we, where we got right and wrong from that. I don't know if that really answered the question, sorry. No, it's good. I, I agree with you, but I don't know what to do there. <laughs> Scott? Yeah, I, I, I have the same, but I kind of looked at the third one before the second one, but it's, it, when you have a complex question versus status quo, status quo is always going to win because you have disparate people all fighting for those other different pieces. It's, it's destined to lose because you're never going to hit majority on 12 different packages that are there. So it has to be like, it does have to be like a recreation sort of package or the overall, overall package, or it's, or it, I don't think anything like that because you're picking and choosing, you start breaking it down really quickly. And um, I don't know, I think that's, that's a communication nightmare um, to try to manage, uh, well, this guy wants this thing on the list and that guy wants something else. And, Whatever, and then nobody really ends up winning um, because thirty percent are going to vote for nothing, and so that is a huge amount. Um, and I think it's our best number probably that we've ever passed anything with about seventy percent. So thirty percent voting for nothing right off the bat. So you have to hammer it out of the park to get any one of these things to pass to beat the nothings. So we have a communication sort of issue if we're going to get to this level of detail and breaking things out. Um, I think in terms of outreach, I think what is great was great was like the museum event. Um, I think it was like uh, it was parks and open space, and community, uh, our transportation did stuff too. Um, all together, and people um, there were presentations, and there was a mix of presentations plus you know the dot boards and, and things that we we've done uh, there before. But uh, going to uh, existing events, so whether they're private events, they're open to the public, like whatever Luck In is putting on, or if it's Cinco de Mayo, it's not just like rhythm on river, right? So it's gotta be a diverse map of events. We have tons of events all over the city. That's where people are out and doing things already. Go and interact with them. Don't just do a city event and have them come to a city event. Go out and find people um, in, special, in special groups um, that are there. I think, a lot of times too, when there's placement for any of these things, I think there should be specific, you know, interest in outreach to those neighborhoods or those communities <coughs> that are most impacted. Right? Um, it's great that you know Dry Creek's now going to get all the stuff that they've wanted for twenty years, um, but there's going to be there's going to be a ton of traffic. So um, how are how are neighborhoods going to deal with traffic, and how do we get the bus to get over there, and how do we get um, roads that are not killing people to go over there because COVID vaccines are horrible. But um, yeah, that sort of stuff. There's a long list of communications. Sounds um, great. I well, you should. Okay. <clears throat> I think you looked in my notes. You did it now. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think people are going to go for this. So it's the Make Lama Awesomer campaign. And you go with enthusiasm, not with pens. And I think that this <laughs> could really go. And yeah, it's a package, but you go with a brainstorm mindset. You go with um, with a listening, uh, open, and enthusiastic mindset. And I think I don't think I don't I think this is going to go. But really, as you said, the diverse group we. We seem to hit 45 to 65 year old white women really well in this city and white men, but we just don't seem to get the voice from any place else. Look around at us, you know what I mean? Like it's, and so Cinco de Mayo, Day of the Dead, go out to those festivals, don't be under a thing, 
have it be around like invite kids and older people like make it make things an unconventional structure um if, you, if it doesn't look like just stand here at this table or if i have this clipboard you get different viewpoints and enthusiasms and ideas when you mix things up like that and um you know you may have people you may have a big sandbox that people are placing things in and then people are talking to people around I don't know, because I didn't think about it for that long, but I think those are the ways to go. School festivals, I think, would be um, a thing to do. Like, schools all have their festivals and their meetings. There's um, the Latino parents, there's Latino parents meetings with the school district. I think that is a very important um, group that doesn't get consulted enough. Um, because uh, they underutilize our facilities quite a bit um, because they have safety concerns that are different maybe than other parents. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be awesome. You just have people make one more awesomer, not the quality of life tax, just how are you going to make one more awesomer? And if people feel like they have agency and they have voice, and that their ideas could come to something, then they're going to get behind it and say, oh, yeah, oh, well, oh, my stuff isn't here, but it's at, it's at the library. It's going to be so cool, right? Like, I'll head it up. Sounds great. <laughs> I don't want to quit my job, but I might have to. Yeah. So I can head it up. Well, there's going to be a transition yes. between on the ballot when some outside entities do need to like manage the mm -hmm. like, yeah. I feel like this needs to happen so. before the ballot. But this is yeah, that's but I think this is the key is we've got to figure out how do we use the outreach to start building excitement so that it's like it's not once it's on the ballot that people start hearing about it. And what about student groups? I mean what about high school student groups? Like let's have them what? plan things. Sorry, that's what, that's what my notes too. Tell me what my notes, but the idea of us going to talk to the kids is kids talking to kids too. If you could get those in the schools, those, you know, make long run awesome or from kids' groups going out talking about it, it'd be great. If you got the yeah. kids to pitch some of the yes, elements that go exactly. over stuff, like a design it's, class yeah. or long run or whatever. Then you got the families and the whole school excited that they're building the thing. Right. I mean, I wish we had a youth council. Lafayette has a youth council. I wish no. our city government. Yeah. We, we do. do, have, we do. We do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so one was following through my original thinking about like who would actually be the beneficiary, the, the best, the most important beneficiary of the rec center, which is the youth groups, I think. And so similar kind of themes of like PPA, maybe school board, um, you know, other events at, at schools uh, in the area, that probably be one area. I'm really trying to get into that, like, those like young families avoid, um, I think you, you said <laughs> the other other group of individuals and, and uh, try to get them uh, so that we don't really hear from us as much uh, as one. And the other thing that comes my mind, um, which is uh, so so millennial on me to say this, but it's like the the you know the world has changed a lot with COVID and we're getting more online and like maybe we should embrace that and so we should be blasting more. I think you know you made us in next door, but like maybe it's not how we necessarily communicate and facilitate these conversations, but we can at least get attention and bring people into the discussion from platforms such as next door and like the Longmont Twitter account and so forth. So those are my two ideas. Maybe like a young person version of next door. <laughs> I don't know what that is actually. I'm not sure either, but I guess I think it's TikTok, but I don't think they have a TikTok. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. Like I'm too old for that. Okay, well, I have some similar. I really would like to see us solicit feedback at all the related facilities so they're actually getting feedback from the people that are using those, like have 
solicit feedback from people that are at Centennial and at the rec center and at the ice pavilion and you know those kinds of things and say like what are your ideas what if you you know what do you need more and what do you need less um i want to make sure if we do surveys that they're really robust kind of statistically relevant surveys and not just like oh fine i love this yeah but really conducting real surveys um, I like the idea of focus groups and also I don't I don't know what you were talking about the meeting at the museum but it sounded like something like that could be fun like some kind of community interactive you know where people can learn about the different ideas and provide feedback and interact with each other um, and I definitely wanted to to make a concerted effort to engage more diverse communities. And I like the idea of going to different events as one way, but also just thinking about locations where you could potentially interact. Maybe grocery stores, I don't know. Hmm. That would be positive or negative. Um, and then I also, I am interested in the idea of us as PRAV, like hosting some kind of community feedback session on the recreation components just to solicit feedback from the recreation community at large. I don't know if we can do that or what that would look like, but I think it's interesting. Okay, Jeff. I went early, I thought of more ideas as we were talking in another yeah. oh, right. place that I think seems to have a lot of people coming through is the farmer's market. Just oh yeah. Mm -hmm. and I was thinking like there's kind of two phases of this in my world. One is the what should go in the building, like that, like what are we gonna pitch? But then there's also that, hey, we decided what we're going to pick, but now we need to get people to vote for it. And at that phase, I feel like there should be maybe city staff, maybe parks and rec board people. I won't be on it anymore, so you guys should do this. But like with setups, with, with, with architectural models and like fun activities, like at things for months before this thing happens, so everyone knows what it is. Not like you said, you're reading the value, like what's this? The staff can't work on it until. Until once it's on the, the, the ballot, you can't work out. out. You, yeah, they can. You can talk like, about it now when you're soliciting feedback. <coughs> oh, yeah. Right. But as soon as it's on the ballot, it can't be a favor. It's not a You should vote for it. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. yeah. It's just the facts. Yeah, right. That's all we can share. Can the PRAB do that? Yes. That, <laughs> mm, there was different opinions <laughs> in 2019. So that we need to vet that with legal because there were some of the legal staff that said no, which yeah. they're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so you're saying we can get feedback on like, what should we build, but once we say we want to try to build this, then it wants to be. As long as it's consistent with city council, yes, we are yes. the annexation of city council. Yeah. Right. My opinion is but, yes, because <laughs> when Dan talks about what happened in 99, the Park and Rec Board was very Part of it. Yeah. Yeah. right. Um, I just have a question. So you know, let's let's go with you know crazy idea. Everything gets passed. We're basically talking about almost doubling the mill levy rate and adding 15 percent to the sales tax rate. I don't think either of those are tenable, right? I mean, <coughs> we have to have a conversation of. Great, this is a brilliant, yeah. let's make off long not awesome list, but that's a huge amount of money that most people can't afford. Yeah. I mean, doubling your property taxes for most people isn't is not gonna is a non -serve. I would agree. I, yeah, so I so there's gotta be some sort of refinement within the conversation because Right, because everybody can just you know ask for everything, you? but you're never going to pass anything. Do you mention so I <clears throat> listened to the recording of the city council? I can go to the meeting, but I listened yeah. to the recording, and you know there was a lot of back and forth among the council members of what should be on, what shouldn't be on, and do you anticipate it's going to be smaller? Like after the initial public outreach and feedback, it will be a smaller package. Uh, I'm, my guess is yes. You know because even. At that meeting, the city manager had made comments about you know, union reservoirs on there, that there was possibly another way to do that, that Montgomery Farm pushed them off the list. There was talk about from different council members about should performing arts stay on there, stay off. You know, the, the big argument for that is that the <coughs> 50 million would be seed money 
to get other investors in to, to really foot the majority of, uh, of that. So there's all those different things that need to be uh, weighed in on. And if it was union, I got, I got a feeling so that it has already had some sort of prioritization. Yeah. And then as the dollars came in, that line would get kind of drawn. It we had those priorities. These are the dollars, and now here's the line that. You probably need that package though in order to get the right. I mean, unless you did something, I mean, I keep thinking about Denver's like culture and facilities district, you know, that generates money and then gets allocated to things that they didn't have to, it wasn't set up with specific things. I'd have to look at the mechanism. Yeah. About creating the district, is that what you're talking about? Or well, I just don't know how they created that. It funds very similar kinds of things, but on an ongoing basis. The, the other thing in the conversation that, you know, there are folks that want to create a library district. And so if that would go to a vote, do dollars for a branch library stay in? You know, I, those are all... There's a lot of things that need to be happening for us to be ready for July or August. Well, I mean, I just back to the conversation about the complexity. I feel like the sooner you all can gather like really meaningful input to narrow down that package, the better. I mean, you know, end of March maybe would be ideal to try to get enough initial feedback to have a prioritized package that you could then, you know, further vet to set things up to decide for on the ballot. Because you're really going to have to build some buzz around it. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify the number you said. Did you say 15% sales tax or 15% increase in sales tax? 15% increase in sales tax. So I'm just looking at a 3.53 to 4.79. Is that the number we're talking about? Oh, it was, I thought it was like. The, the uh, current city sales tax is 3.53 percent. Yeah, it says 1.26. It's even higher now. Well, that's yeah. for the city's part of it. Yeah. Altogether, we pay eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're talking about I thought it was three point. Yeah, I thought it was 3.53, a little over four because of. So, uh, the bottom. I was looking at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, no, not 15 percent sales tax. Yeah, no, I'm not 15 percent sales tax. 15 percent increase. So the bottom of, of chart, uh, the top chart on page 10 says that it is 0.56 percent uh, add-on to the 5.53 but the text above it says right. that it is 1.26 percent so it's actually right. increase okay it was the 15 percent that's scared me yeah, yeah, yeah. no it's not to increase in sales tax but there's no way it's a it's a 15 percent okay. increase but, yeah. yeah um um cool um, <clears throat> so, this is a separate, separate thing, but related. Anything else on this? Yeah. Just idea for the marketing side of it to get other groups out there. Just because Ben and I have been involved with this, but um, there's other groups in Longmont have benefits of trying to make Longmont awesome. We were on the the group for the visit Longmont and the chamber there too, and all those groups mm -hmm. can kind of get behind trying to mm -hmm. do some marketing to try to push us out to make benefit for them as well too. So my related but separate question is during that um, conversation there were two council members who were advocating for using some of the existing Denver Broncos funds to go with Dome. And I didn't really understand what that was. I mean it sounds like a recreation facility is what they had in mind, but they weren't necessarily in favor of the rec center. So I just wondered if you guys have any more information about, or if that you heard the same amount that I heard. Yeah, okay. And it's only like a million dollars, so you can't. No, or, or operate it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A little small, then. You may be really small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How is that related to the Broncos? Spinal tablets. So, yeah. so yeah. the city of Longmont okay. got yeah. just under a million dollars from the sale of the Broncos, um, all different, uh, everybody that was in the, uh, what is the name of the district? The, uh, yeah, the, what, uh, yeah. Stadium, yeah. Stadium, 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 Stadium
got the money back and the city got almost a million dollars. So there's a number of ideas of how to use that money. Yeah. The challenge is, is you really can't start new programs because once the money's gone, there's nothing to keep that right. uh, those programs going. So uh, a number of council members have made suggestions of how that money could be used. And I believe they're having a discussion about that at the first meeting in January. Sound like we could repair Centennial Pool and then we just have some. Well, I think the one thing though that it brings up is you know we have talked about sort of the the cost factor associated with the rec center and you know I think if there were my sense was this was something that would be more affordable access to recreation that was the idea I don't I mean whether or not it would actually work but I think that the notion of is there a way in the future to be able to make some of the recreation facilities more affordable? Is there like a sliding scale? Can we reduce the need for the you know the facilities to cover so many of their own costs? Yeah. You know, that's we don't have to talk about that today, but I think that that's a factor that we should be thinking about in the future. Okay, cool. Good discussion. So, where do you think it will be in January when we have our meeting? Do you think you guys will be have be working on your outreach plan? Yes. When will we'll be ready to report back? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for sharing. All right. So, we still have an agenda. Discuss items from the packet updates. Did anyone have questions from the updates provided in the packet? Scott? I, um, so um, I, I'm just curious, uh, since we're pretty much we're done with the year, and uh, through, I think it's the first full year of recreation money being utilized in terms of, um, uh, you know, I think it's 750000 or whatever, 744. How does that look pre COVID or whatever? Or how, uh, yeah, that's what we hope for. Yeah, we're how, how much is it? Two, two, we're about 250 yeah. ahead. Wow, of yeah. 19 members. So not just having majors like you know, collect money, we collected more. They did. I think you know, the things that were, as I looked at that program, there's a couple of reasons we wanted to do that. One is there's almost a disincentive for the rangers who are trying to control activity and people and right. manage behavior to try to increase use as they're trying to, to manage that. So I think having recreation manage that, and then the rangers focusing on those other pieces, I think really put the right skill sets in the right spot to really help facilitate that. And I think we have some good conversations between the groups on how, as you increase use, what we need to make do to make sure that we keep it safe and fun for everybody too. It really seems like the staff are trying to figure out how we work together. This last year was much better than the first year. And, and that that sounded horrible, but it just it was just a we got our feet underneath us and and only feel like that's gonna continue to get better. Okay. As an example of union being we sort of ignored for a long time or disorganized is we're trying to go through the boat storage and say there's 50 boats there. There's only 10 that have actual owners that we know of. And some people, some are abandoned, some are you know, no license, no marking. We are, our staff is checking through state records and trying to figure out who owns these boats and whether they want them back or whatever. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of, it's just a little old, old place we're trying to slowly build up to modern times. It's starting yeah. a city sailing program. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're having monthly meetings now with the Rangers mm -hmm. and it's just, it's, it's, and it's not just last year. It, it really has evolved over the last five years. And then COVID had its had its thing, but it was the first place to come back in COVID and, and killed it. So um, it's an interesting area that we're, you know, and the boat store is a really good example of it. The Rangers don't want to have anything to do with the administration of that. Well, we're really good at that. That's an area we really excel. And they're really good at checking on the things and their facilities and, and getting the physical part of it. So we got a really, I think, a really good handle on a whole new boat storage thing, which you know, we were we were cheap, we were we were too cheap for boat storage. So 
probably the same, so yeah. related. Um, so if someone goes to boat there, everybody knew you pay every other year, and then nobody would ever really right. worry because your sticker was kind of new, and that's all you just that's what everybody just like watched out for each other. That's what you would do, just make sure you stop them, even if you never used your boat. That's kind of how it sticker yeah, that green green is over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. But like it, you would have to go you would have to go to Union Grants to get to be like, I want to pay. And they're like, yeah. I don't even know how to do that. Well that's where you know the Jeff Screw and then have done a great job of you know trying to modernize that and make sure people have easier ways to pay. Okay. Um yeah, I think there's just nothing but opportunities out there to and then the Rangers have ordered new pylon setups, new markers, you know, stickers that are going on the boats. Again, that conversation we we can have is that you know Jeff has been on that cost recovery and, and putting dollars into programs, return dollars on investment. When PWNR and Public Works Natural Resources really ran that, it just went right back to the general fund and it was kind of gone. So I think the idea now that you know Jeff and his group can take those dollars and try to reinvest and try to, to do more of them is great. Yeah. There was a short update about Macintosh Lake is now in the city. Did we ever get a boat? There was a discussion a year ago that we, and I never ever saw it. Maybe no. we didn't need it, but we, we do need it. So oh. um, Dan Wolford's there's some extra at Union. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. Yeah. Oh, no, no, Why not? <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's the ones you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there was going to be a patrol yes. on weekends. So, and, yeah. so yeah. we we just that was one of the supply chain things that we just have not been able to get. Okay. It's, it's been on order. Um, Bryce has been working on that, so we have taken one of the open space boats and we have been able to get it out there. We have had people on the water actually a, a little bit, but oh, okay. um, I just have, it's actually stored over there at Macintosh, so it was kind of stored back here, now it is stored over there, so the rangers can go take that out. So yes, it's a rollover to finish up the acquisitions on that. Our fleet managers that do those boats, they also do everything that has a motor on it and I, as the city is trying to make this transition towards electric vehicles and stuff they are just overwhelmed with supply chain issues and trying to um, get the vehicles we need um but i just know ATVs, the problem has kind of settled down in my opinion and have you seen that too i think we have in the well. usage and stuff this year and so i didn't know if we decided not to bother or i was just curious and you know you reminded me with the update yeah. here so we have two two jet skis on there. Right? Yes, that's what it, ah, that's what it is. We'll also be utilized. That might be a smarter, easier way, way to go. Yeah, you're that's right. Yeah. We talked to Fire about the best vehicle to have for patrol out there, and, and our fire department said it's by far a lot easier to trailer move. Yeah, you know, yeah. Access to and contact people on a jet. Yeah, you're open and, and, and the here I'm right part of the community. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. All the water. It's just, there's a lot of stuff. IG Fired actually comes over and partners, partners with us and they do their, their training out there on their jet skis as well. Uh, so. Okay. The other, the other one I had was on the Button Rock was mentioned in here that February we get an update, I think it is. I've had several people complain to me or tell me that they still take their dogs and let them off the leash. Are dogs going to be allowed or disallowed when that comes out? So that will be part of the conversation going to council. I'm not sure if Danielle is going to give the updates on that, but I think the, the staff recommendation going forward would be the no dogs, but I think we also have looked at what our response would be if the public or council gave us other direction too. I've had several people say they will be showing up with guns. I mean, I'm literally, that I want to take my dog there. They're already grumbling about having to have it on a leash on right. Sleepy lion part. You know. People on council that feel the same way. Okay, so well, I'm just, I'll be. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious if that was out there in public yet. That anyway, thanks. What's yeah. the current rule? Sorry. Um, leashed it's, everywhere now. It's leashed everywhere, and one dog two per two one dog, dog per person, dog per right. person on a leash. And the proposal is no. Well, there's no other. Right now, they're really we haven't got that out. Mm -hmm. Daniel's still working on that, but you well, know, working on. I mean, somebody's right. making a decision. Well, there'll be, there'll be decisions, staff recommendations to council, and then council will be able to take public input, ask staff how that fits into it, what the re rationale for those staff recommendations are, um, based on truly the desire at Button Rock and our management plan is laid out that the primary reason we have Button Rock is for our water, water quality, and watershed. 
Are they going to outlaw geese too then? <laughs> I mean, have you been by Macintosh lately? We don't have a geese problem up there. But, yeah, yeah, and geese don't have the same kind of disease transfer that. So then the sex you have the water quality, so you talk about that. The next piece that we look at Button Rock is really a, is a preserve, and that really is to provide a place for wildlife. No, no, I yeah, understand all this. So then you get down to this, the, 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 the tertiary piece is how do we bring humans and their activities into that environment. And, and that's the way we'll kind of present our findings. And then council can direct staff how they see that. They're, they're coming, they're coming in years the board, with the though. update. Yeah. You're the water yes. board and somebody yeah. else though who's in yeah. the thing. And sustainability at least. I think it's yeah. water okay. sustainability. Yeah, I forgot. <coughs> okay, thanks. Okay. I have one quick question. I just wondered if that RFD for the minister plan is out. We, Jeff and I, are going to be meeting on Wednesday to finalize some verbiage and send it to procurement to get out. Right. So early January. Early January. Well, okay. she's she's done work on it, so I'm hoping it's really quick. There's, <coughs> shouldn't be any hold up. As soon as we can finalize some of these angles that we want to have on there, and then that's a whole process that's very similar to what we just talked about, as far as the the public input and, and all of that. And that'll be a whole package of everything you guys have just talked about, specifically related to recreation center. And then and recreation programs. Okay. Um, any other items from the packet? Okay. I just kind of wanted to check on Nino Gallo Park, and um, it looks like it's ninety percent. And um, the last the last time I saw, there were two pickleball courts. Um, I was just at the Casa de la Esperanza, their Christmas posada, and. Um, I was at their Halloween thing, and I've talked to different families at both ones, and none of them really know what's going on with the park or that, and they're asking, like, what's, what's there? And something that I'm hearing a lot is uh, soccer, um, because that neighborhood, they don't play pickleball in that neighborhood. Um, and I think that's supposed to be, a, is that a neighborhood park or a community park? It's a neighborhood park. It's a neighborhood park, and there's going to be a community park nearby. Right. But that's where, like, the hotbed of uh, St. Rain's best soccer players are. Um, the, the best soccer players that go on to Nyalot High School and lead it to championships are that trailer park right there in Casa de la Esperanza. And they don't actually have a place to play. They play on, um, and they. I don't think that they need marked goals and things like that necessarily. They need marked, but soccer is really important to that neighborhood, and they kind of fight for soccer rights. So, like in their yards where they have it, it goes directly into people's gardens when they kick the ball and things like that. <clears throat> and I know that like one click made a pickleball court, but. I just kind of wanted to see There'll it. There'll be a large like, open turf area there for field sports. Okay. Being in a neighborhood park, we don't typically program soccer there. Like it's not Sandstone Ranch. It doesn't have the park, parking capacity for that. Yeah. It doesn't have the parking capacity for that. But there's nothing that says you can't have recreation games there um, okay. whenever you want to. Yeah. I so, definitely um, didn't want to. There won't parking. be goals or anything like that. It'll bring your own cones and put down pennies, whatever, whatever. I've, I've done it all sorts of different ways in, okay. um, when, in my career playing soccer. And so... There will be open turf there. Okay. That but, can be used for soccer. Yeah, I definitely wasn't thinking of it because program soccer doesn't, that's not access to to youth in need. They don't have access to that. Yeah, so that's what I was looking for. And I'm just wondering, I don't know, if we could have a marked a mark area that wasn't programmed that people could, could we have a marked soccer area with marked goals? No. <coughs> It, it sets a different standard, and if you mark it and put goals there, the soccer groups will want to play games there, and that causes a whole different set of issues. And we went on through the whole public process saying that this is going to be an open turf field yeah. for whatever sort of uses, so we're not going to change it now that have one sport there. It'll be available for all sorts of different field sports, flying a kite, having a picnic. Set up your volleyball or badminton nets, go play soccer, go play baseball, whatever you want to do out there. Great. Okay. 
And um, what what's what school do they go to? They go to Indian Peaks. It, and what about the middle schoolers? They go to Sunset. Sunset. Okay. And then they go to Nywak High School. Some of them, are, some of those kids are are playing in our soccer program that we have for middle school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so the yeah. Sunset's yeah. always in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's killer soccer. Like, I, I wouldn't even go out there and play with them like, and mess around with them because, like, I get creamed. I mean, I've tried it before, but I get creamed. And promise not to. <laughs> so, we're technically, like, over time. If we want to, it's 8.35. Do we want to extend till 8.45? I don't know that we need to vote. <laughs> if it's only going to be 10 minutes. Does anyone have anything? It'll work for me. Major. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just plan. If we go past 8.45, then we do have to vote. <laughs> um, I don't, do you have anything, items from staff? I, I just have one. I, I really want to thank the um, staff from what was community services, um, library, recreation, museum, children, youth, and family for all helping with Longmont Lights this last weekend. Um, again, two, two beautiful <coughs> nights uh, weather-wise and just uh, lots and lots of people. So thank you to them and to the community for continuing to support that event. Um, Should have booth for the the challenge and that might be where you could help us because a lot of times when we we're organizing the event we don't have any staff that can do the booth because they're all out doing stuff right yeah it'd be fun yeah so we Yeah, we are actually for Project Eight Five. We are having our first educational session with vendors on Wednesday. The RFP is going out tomorrow for the first two neighborhood parks, so the Fox Meadows and Clover Meadow. So um, we are uh, proposals will be due early February. So probably more information in January. This yeah. is the design build thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it's good. Um, anything from the board? Quick items, Scott? I said a quick item, it's a recreation item. There are these stickers that are on swings that I don't know if they're official or not. That um, Mark, they're at Thompson Park, and I saw one sticker at Roosevelt Park. Um, so that's what makes me think that they're not official. And basically saying that the swings are for the, up to the age of 12. Those are official. Those and are official. There is something that people love taking those stickers off. We tried stuff. All, we use yes. Gorilla Tape over them. We've done everything. Are they saying the max age is 12? Yeah. They, they actually, depending on the structure, they'll have different <laughs> ages on them. Okay. And those are supposed to be up there. And then when we have playground inspections, that's one of the things that they will look for is those stickers are on there so that people know the, the right age requirements. And the park staff just carries bundles of those trying to keep them on um, and it's just been a challenge. Okay, because the stickers have been placed on other things and stuff. Too. Oh really? So, yeah, so they, 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 they get pulled off and move them. Yeah, they get pulled off and get put on yeah. other parts of like, the park equipment or whatever, but that's why I, I'm like, does someone have this collection from Amazon or something? <laughs> these stickers? <laughs> <they're> just, <laughs> so it just feel, felt like um, felt like a very young age to say like you can't like swing on a swing at right? the age of 12. Um, yeah, are yeah. you feeling attacked because you're like, seriously? Well, that's, I, know, I, mean, I, just, I just thought I was like, right. I think that, that sounds like a young age to say that's what the world is. I'm not really making fun of it. Yeah, and I, I, we do, I do talk about it some design. We do try even separating those age groups with the types of students and stuff we do go there to give okay. give a little separation in, in the age groups. It's a little bit of CUA for the manufacturer as far as if you're yeah. a 700 pound 13 year old, you shouldn't be on swings. But if, if you're a 150 pound 30 year old, it's not a problem. But if you, you sign things, it's all down the course. Yeah. It's all liability. Are they relatively new? Because those swings have been there in both parts forever. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they have to. Both do for replacement. Both right. of those yeah. 
So that would not be something that would be enforced. Like no park staff would be like, you're too old for those swings. No, it's usually the other way around. If someone gets hurt on something where it's not age appropriate, you know, those are the things that it's, no one enforces it until it ends up in court. Okay. Thank you. Carting kids in the swing. Get out of there, you crazy. I think that's the way it is. And there, it's like, oh, you're gone. That's what those cameras were for in the park. Yeah. That's, Okay. Anything else before we wrap up? All right, Jeff and Rose, thanks again. Yes, Enjoy thank your, you. Your thank free you. time on. If you guys want to name the next center after us, it could be Gangwar Owen Bogan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That would I like good. that. That's awesome. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do you have a second? I'm just doing my cricket guy, just so you know that. All right. All in favor?